We've spent the last few weeks looking at the idea of grace and how it is that we are made right with God, even though we do wrong things. Last week, we explored sanctifying grace, grace that helps us on our journey to be holy. It's the stuff at work even after we choose God for the first time and get saved. We found that being holy isn't about trying harder and forcing ourselves to do the right thing. It's about trusting God more after we've messed up uh, time and time again. It's connecting with God when we've chosen a path separate from him. The key question is always, will you come back? Will you turn to God again? That's how sanctification works. We keep holy by pressing in to God more. Uh, We are going to spend the next couple of weeks lingering on this idea of sanctification. After all, this is the vast majority of our Christian lives. How do we press in and connect with God more? And I'd like us to keep a visual in mind here. Uh, When I first moved here to the church's property, my home is just up the hill from the church here. And when I moved in, I came uh, uh, over to what's the, what we call the coffee nook in our kitchen, and I noticed there was a, a little Scrabble board, uh, a little Scrabble rack that had some uh, letters that were glued into the rack. Now, I'm a Scrabble player, so I was immediately drawn to this, and glued on were the words, grow grace. Now, for us ch- church folk, we might immediately think of this church, Grace United Methodist Church. Grow this church so it has more people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, the first thing I think of when I see the words grow grace is to grow in grace in my own life, to be more grace-filled, to live in such a way that people experience God's unmerited favor, God's love and grace through me. So the next two weeks, we will be talking about what it means to grow grace. It's the focus of our Christian lives. So think of that Scrabble board reminding you every day when you get your coffee or tea, grow grace. Let's hear now our scripture for today. It might seem like a hard right-hand turn away from sanctification, but I'd like to make the case that one of the most important steps we can take, one of the key factors of how we can grow in holiness, is built into the very order of creation. Our first reading comes from Exodus chapter 31. It's verses 12 through 17. I invite you now to hear God's word. The Lord said to Moses, You yourself are to speak to the Israelites. You shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it shall be cut off from among the people. For six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of holy, solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore the Israelites shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And we have a second reading for you here. This is from the Gospel of Mark. These are the words of Jesus. It's just one verse, but very apropos uh, for today. Then Jesus said to the religious leaders, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. The word of the Lord for the people of God. 
thanks be to God. So I wonder, have you ever been totally exhausted? I mean, so tired you can feel it in your bones. As if just getting out of bed or accomplishing one more task would take Herculean strength for you to do it. As, as a child, I used to love when I would wake up from a dream, but not totally wake up. I would be half frozen. I had sort of cloudy thoughts. I could notice things around me, but I just couldn't move. There's actually a technical term for this state. It's called sleep paralysis, and it happens for just a few seconds, or for some, maybe a minute or two, as we pass from waking to sleeping or from sleeping to waking up. I imagine for some people, those few seconds of being mostly awake but unable to move could be alarming for them. We, we might think to ourselves, what's wrong? Why can't I move? Oh no, what, what if this is permanent for me? We move at a million miles an hour, and even one bump in the road can be terrifying to us. But if we are exhausted in our waking life, it can be just as terrifying for us. We often place our worth and value in the things that we do. If you just walked up to someone and asked them how much they are worth, I guarantee that they will try to tell you, or at least come try to think up a number of all the money and assets that they own. I am worth this week's salary and all my retirement saving, or I am worth the price of my house and the resale value of my cars. My value is equal to the stuff I own. And the only way I can own stuff and more stuff is by the work that I do. The more work, the more value. That's how we think of it in the world. So we work harder and harder until finally we find ourselves completely and utterly exhausted, unable to do anything more. It's a vicious cycle, and it isn't even close to the truth for us as humans. Even society at large sees this. I was listening to the radio a few weeks ago, and they were talking about how years ago the government had to decide how much people are worth. Uh, it was on a, a Planet Money radio broadcast. They have to decide things like, should we require seat belts or no smoking signs? And the test for it is simple. If the cost to implement this law is lower than the total value of the lives saved, then the gov government would do it. If seatbelts cost more, though, than the, saves, the lives that are saved, then they wouldn't do it. So back in the 1980s, they had to come up with a number to answer how much is a life worth. And they actually put a dollar figure on our lives. It's called the cost of death. And back then, it was right around $300,000. And today, it's about $800,000. It's based on how much money we earn in a lifetime. Back then, that calculation against the expense of safety features left a, a lot of things out. Uh, there was asbestos, sulfuric acid that could burn you, uh, explosives. None of it had to be labeled because, well, it would only save several thousand people and their lives the value of their lives didn't add up to enough money. So no ink and paper to label these chemicals saving people's lives because it cost too much money. Now, today we would look at that and we might scoff. What do you mean thousands of lives aren't worth some ink and paper? Intuitively, we know that we are worth more than just the money we make at work. Eventually, the government did acknowledge this. It's quite an interesting story, but the new calculation they came up with, the one we are still using today, doesn't say we are worth what we make at work. 
It says, we are worth so much more than that. We are each worth millions and millions of dollars. I dare say, we are worth even more than that. That's why life isn't just work and work and even more work. We are more than the work we do. We are more than the possessions we own. God says we are his holy people. We are chosen by him. And because of this, we need a Sabbath, a day of rest. I wonder if you caught that in today's scripture reading. There was this quote in there. It said, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you, that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Sabbath rest is a sign of holiness. I want us to pause for a moment and work out what Sabbath is and then see how that connects with us being sanctified, which is God's grace that works in us to make us holy. So Sabbath means day of rest, but this command is certainly more than just rest. In today's passage from Exodus, the case is made that God rested, so we need to rest too. But over in Deuteronomy, uh, another book that has a parallel passage, there's a, a twist in the command. God says that Israel was once enslaved by the Egyptians. Because of that experience, Israel knows what it's like to be driven hard and to be forced to work every day without rest. But God did not leave them in that state. Instead, God chose to liberate Israel from their never-ending labor. So, in the same way that God freed Israel from perpetual work, we too are freed from it. This wasn't just for some of the people either. It was for everyone. It was men, it was women, it was children, and maids, and servants. Your class, or the kind of work you did, did not matter. As slaves were freed from their work, so we all are freed from ours on the Sabbath. This command was taken pretty seriously in ancient times too. No work meant not preparing food. You couldn't go get water from the river. You couldn't borrow some sugar from your neighbor or carry anything. You heard in the scripture that breaking these commandments, breaking this Sabbath law, meant your death. It, it also included all kinds of things like you couldn't work in the field. You couldn't light a fire or use a hammer. Basically, Anything that looked like it might lean towards being work was prohibited. Plenty of people like the idea of taking a break, but then when you hear how restrictive it is, it seems far less fun, doesn't it? No baking? No sports? Sabbath rest just went from a needed break to a life-altering prohibition. I imagine many of us, if we lived with this kind of division between our six days of work and one day of total and absolute rest, a literal day of rest, we would be put off by it. We would probably be bored. What do you do all day? Here's one ancient instruction on Sabbath rest. One is not to climb a tree, nor ride on an animal, nor swim in water, nor clap the hands, nor slap the hips, nor dance. Only two things were specifically encouraged on Sabbath. One was worship, and the other was eating and drinking. For worship, people sang. The scriptures were read, and a priest or rabbi would interpret it, just like we do today. For food, guests were invited over and lavish entertainment given. An extra meal was added to the day, although I bet they didn't call it fourth meal back then. Basically, the rest of the day was spent in celebration, a big party celebrating God's work among the people. You might be wondering, how could they do all this without doing any work the day of these big parties, these big celebrations? And the answer is 
that everything was done in advance. All meals, all wine and supplies were prepared ahead of time so that the people were able to genuinely rest on the Sabbath. Now, there were some exceptions. Sabbath never banned all work. Some things still needed to be done. So no one ever yells at the pastor for working on Sunday, right? Church work was considered okay, which included the temple ministry. So anything that was done in connection to the temple to maintain it and to keep it running smoothly. Uh, And the Passover sacrifice, that was never banned. If someone was in danger of dying by fire or war, or they had an illness, taking care of those things was okay. Basically, keeping people alive superseded the rules of Sabbath. That's why Jesus says in Mark 2, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. If we are convinced that the rule of rest is more important than our lives, it is easy to get caught up in living by that rule. That is wrong-headed, though. Jesus is reminding us there is always something more important than the rule. People are more important than rules. Life is more important than rules or rest. If the rule is getting in the way of people staying alive, we've missed the whole point. Sabbath adds to our lives. It enhances life by pulling us away from work and giving us a chance to truly be at rest. So I've never really been good at resting When our family goes on vacation, I am the one that just can't sit still. My wife, Emily, loves to go to the beach, and I think to myself, oh no, what torture, what's worse than laying in one spot for six hours getting sunburn? And I always get sunburn, that's a guarantee. We'll go camping, and I am looking up 37 things to do at the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. I want to go down the checklist and make sure that we hit every single attraction there is. Emily looks at me like I have two heads and has to remind me that vacation is not a competition. There is no prize for doing everything possible in one trip. I have to learn to truly be at rest by pausing, sensing God's presence, and celebrating the life that I have. People living through a pandemic might feel strange about this command to rest. Many of us who work from home may feel like we've gotten too much time with our families. We may long to invite people over as guests, but that might be inappropriate right now. Or we have to keep people away to protect loved ones who are particularly at risk from COVID-19. What does rest mean in the midst of a pandemic. What does rest mean for us now? Others may want to work, but can. Maybe they can't find a job in this difficult market or because of other circumstances, they can't expose themselves to the virus. What do people without work need a Sabbath for? And I think the point is that Sabbath is about something much larger than just not working, or working too much. It's more than just finding balance and getting some rest. Sabbath is a complete break from the usual rhythm of life. It points us to what really matters. We don't work and make money and get food because that is life. We do all those things so that we might live. And living is about so much more than our possessions or careers. It's really about freedom to be who we are, freedom to celebrate and worship God. In ancient Israel, they had a a really deep understanding of this connection. The Sabbath was directly tied to something called 
the sabbatical year. Every seven years, the land was given rest. And instead of farming it as they usually would, no crops would be planted and no crops were harvested. God promised that he would provide all that the people needed in the year preceding the sabbatical. And researchers, they found all kinds of benefits that come from this kind of rest for the land, but it actually gets even better than that. Every seven years, debts would be forgiven, and private land that had been sold would become common land again, and food would be redistributed so everyone had enough to eat. There were no winners or losers in the sabbatical year. And after seven sabbatical cycles, slaves would be set free. Today, we use the word sabbatical to mean an extended leave of absence from work to rest or recover or to take a season to study. It is a kind of freedom that comes to us when grace is extended to us by God. We may not deserve a break like that. We may not have earned enough money to warrant leaving and going off to study more, but it's part of the grace God wants us to impart to one another. It is in the very foundation of how God ordered the universe. But it is also our identity as the beloved of God, rescued from captivity, given a purpose and hope in Christ. To close, I'd like to offer just a touch of that sanctification that comes through Sabbath. I'd like to do that through a simple guided meditation. There's nothing magical about this. It is just a way to slow our minds and open ourselves to the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to get comfortable as you are seated and to close your eyes, clear your mind, of the activities of the day. Take that to-do list that you have and put it to the side for a moment. I want you to breathe deep. Take in a breath through your nose and slowly exhale through your mouth. Do it again. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. There's nothing to trouble you in this space. I want you to imagine a place outdoors that you love very much. It could be a place from your childhood, or maybe just something you make up. I imagine a wooded area, the mountain in the distance. There's a beautiful stream flowing through it. Look around you and take in the scene. Walk along the path you find. See the wildlife in this place as you walk. You love to be. It is so special. As you walk, there is a clearing. As it opens up, you can see for some distance now. And in the middle of this clearing is a homestead. It's quaint. But it looks like a place you would really like to be. I want you to walk toward this home. At the door, you think about knocking, but clearly someone was waiting for you. The door opens for you, and there stands Jesus. He wants you to come in, to spend time with him, to be with him. He has some food and drinks prepared for you, It's your favorite. How did he know? You feel so at peace. You feel so at home. So known and so loved. And as you're talking with Jesus, someone else enters the room. It's your best friend. Your best friend is here with you. And with them are your closest family members. Some you have not seen in years. Some have even died years before, but yet here they are. You are surrounded by the people that know you and love you best. 
it's almost as if this whole gathering was just for you. You feel so loved, so full, so happy. You feel at peace. You feel like you are getting the rest your mind and body needs. This is what Sabbath does for us. Sabbath rest makes us feel close with Jesus. It connects us to family and friends. What is more holy than that? Go ahead and open your eyes. I invite you to consider how God calls us to be free. To feel rested. So be holy, not through the obligation of a slave, but through the freedom that comes through Sabbath. Amen?